Good afternoon and welcome to the panel today. Um, my name is Neil Lunderville. I'm the general manager of the Burlington Electric Department in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, today, the panel that you're in, in case you want to make sure where you are, it's about breaking barriers and expanding market solutions for low and fixed income neighbors. Are we all in the right spot? Well, great to have such a room. So many people uh, joining us for this panel today. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's been a growing consensus in the energy industry that we do face a widening disparity between people of low, moderate, and fixed income and their more affluent neighbors in accessing and participating in energy innovations and transformative technology. You know, in fact, in some ways, we're on the verge of leaving behind a very important and very large group of our customers, which if, if we don't solve this problem soon, it could grow into one of the larger challenges facing utilities in Vermont and around the country. Now, here's the problem in a nutshell. With more and more customers taking advantage of small-scale renewables and distributed energy resources, utilities are facing uh, a situation where we have declining kilowatt hour sales, which historically have been the revenue base for utilities. Now, overall, this is a, I think we would agree, this is a good thing. People are switching to renewables. We're making the, the grid greener and more resilient. But the downside of it is that it means there are fewer kilowatt hours for us to share the fixed cost of running those utilities. And the folks that are left pay to pay the increased uh, share are low to moderate income customers who are not well positioned uh, or lack the resources to take advantage of energy innovations like rooftop solar or EVs. You know, to some extent, our public policy uh, here in Vermont, but you know, more nation nationally as well, has uh, exacerbated this problem. Um, we've, we've offered programs that have promoted the public good, uh, and we've, uh, like net metering, standard offer, and they've had an unintended consequence, and that's that low to moderate income customers uh, have been the ones subsidizing the switch to renewables for the more affluent customers. You know, we, we saw a similar problem with a little bit different characteristics in the telecommunications field, where people, where the switch to cell phones left the landline customers footing the bill for the remaining fixed cost of the network. And, it, and certainly looking at that field over the last 10 years, it's not a path that we in the energy, in energy industry want to follow. Um, now, from, we know from a renewable perspective, um, uh, the uh, move to... Uh, the energy revolution has a lot of benefits for low to moderate income customers. Uh, and, we, but, and so we know we're trying to do that as quickly as we can. But we also know something that there really is something that needs to be done. We cannot leave their low and moderate income customers with increasingly high marginal cost of operating, running the grid. This has the effect of worsening the economic divide uh, that we see in the state and undermining the ability of all of us, utilities, companies, um, and, and policymakers uh, to provide that quality service for everyone. Um, but I want to say the news is not all bad. Uh, in recent years, uh, we have seen uh, the industry, we have seen policymakers, we've seen utilities uh, piloting new ways to support low and moderate income customers. We've seen a lot of great developments like uh, no, no upfront cost solar contracts and programs to get customers to participate in community energy and community solar farms, even if they're a renter. This is a great start. But today we're gonna to explore this topic a lot more, and I'm really pleased that we have a really great panel, uh, one that represents some of the best thinking uh, in the industry about how to help low and moderate income households. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna introduce the panel uh, first, and then I'll ask uh, Justine to come up after I introduce everybody. Um, so first we have Justine Sears. Justine is a consultant in the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation's uh, Transportation Efficiency Division. Uh, she has a specialty in travel behavior and transportation energy use. Her work at VEIC is focused on environmental and economic impacts of transportation policies and our travel choices. Uh, today, she's going to be uh, talking about the energy burden uh, on uh, low and moderate income customers. It's a study that she has done while she was at, at when her work at VEIC. Our second panelist, Krista Schutt, she is the Global Energy Fellow for Climate Justice 
uh, at the Institute for Energy and the Environment at Vermont Law School. Uh, at the Institute, she leads, the projects, she leads projects in the Energy Clinic focused on energy sustainability for low-income populations. Um, she's had a varied background, including the, in, in addition to running her own uh, design and manufacturing business, she's also worked at All Earth Renewables, um, did business development for the Vermont Telecommunications Authority, Telecom Authority, uh, and worked for VEIC. Um, she's a lawyer by trade, um, coming with, uh, uh, she earned her JD, I, did you, would you have earned it at Vermont Law School? Yeah. At Vermont Law School, um, with certificates in energy law, climate law, and dispute resolution. And our last panelist today will be Jason Edens, who has uh, traveled far to arrive in Vermont from uh, Bacchus, Minnesota, the, the northern Minnesota, uh, where Jason is the director of the Rural Renewable Energy Alliance. It was founded in, in uh, 2000, where, where he helped co-found it with a group of dedicated volunteers. volunteers. Um, and under his leadership, the, uh, the alliance has grown out of the basement to literally out of your basement. Right, Jason? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> and has now performed over 500 low-income installations and hundreds of market-rate installations. Uh, we want to hear a lot more about this exciting program from Jason. One last note about Jason. He has his master's in environmental studies from Ben... I'm going to say this wrong. Ben, Bemidji. Bemidji State University. So let's welcome our panel and welcome up to the front, Justine. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So as Neil said, I'm going to be presenting some work that I did exploring patterns in energy burden and energy spending here in Vermont. And I think the later panelists, Krista and Jason, are going to get more into policies and solutions, but I'm really going to be characterizing the problem. So very briefly, I work at VEIC. I'm a consultant in our transportation division. The bulk of the work that we do is, we're a nonprofit, and the bulk of the work we do is implement efficiency programs. And I worked with one of those programs, Efficiency Vermont, on this project. Um, I brought them this idea, which they ended up funding. And I really, I had two primary goals. Um, one was to bring transportation into the conversation around energy affordability um, and spending. Um, and the other was to kind of explore how spatial analysis could augment Efficiency Vermont's planning and programming that they currently offer. So we took a really holistic view of energy. Of course, now that I'm here at REV, I realize we have a gaping gap, which is renewables. So that's next year. Next year, I will be back with a whole new study on renewables, access to renewables. But this year, the, the focus was spending on household heating, electricity, and transportation. And so by transportation energy, we mean primarily gasoline. Every once in a while, it's electricity or diesel, but the vast majority of the time, it's gasoline to fuel your vehicle. Um, so we explored both spending and burden. And by burden, we mean the percentage of household income, so the relative amount that a household is spending. And we were interested in geographic patterns in both of those. Um, so an analysis like this could be useful for a variety of things. If you were interested in, um, in you know, and gaining a lot of savings, you would go to areas that are spending a lot and using a lot. And if you were interested in identifying areas of the state that are most in need of some kind of relief or assistance, you would use burden as your guide or your metric. So this, in this map, this is total energy burden. So the sum of household spending in each of those categories, heating, electricity, and transportation, um, as a function of household income, um, and we use the hotspot analysis in a mapping program, ArcGIS, and that hotspot analysis identifies clusters. So areas in red are clusters that are spending more than the statewide average on energy in terms of the percentage of household income, and so they're highly burdened. And cold spots are, um, they have a, a relatively low burden. And there's no huge surprises, I don't think, Chittenden County, is an enormous cold spot. Um, so burden is a function of both income. So incomes there are high, which is gonna make your relative burden low. There's also access to natural gas. It's the most densely populated, or populated area of the state, so vehicle miles travel to transportation energy use is low. So you have all these factors that kind of come together and make this big cold spot. Whereas the Northeast Kingdom emerges as a really prominent hot spot 
and it's kind of the opposite of Chittenden County, right? Incomes are relatively low, there's no access to natural gas, and VMT, or vehicle miles traveled, is gonna be relatively high. So we have a really prominent hotspot there. Let's see, and one more plug for transportation. Um, I've actually presented this work I think two more, two other times in less formal settings, and I went through all the slides, and in the question and answer period, it became apparent that people had missed the transportation piece somehow, and I think it's such a, it's so often left out of conversations around energy that it can really surprise people, and they, or just kind of, they can miss it entirely. So I just wanted to touch on, this is, these are the components of the average household, of average household spending in Vermont. So most households are spending about a quarter of their energy on electricity, a quarter on heating, and then half on transportation. And that's not necessarily a huge surprise, but it, it's too large a piece, I think, to leave out of conversations around greenhouse gas emissions, around affordability, around access to clean energy. So my hope in, in this analysis was just to bring that to the forefront. So our unit of analysis was the census block group, which is an area designated by the census that contains between 600 and 3,000 people. So in an urban area, that can be a neighborhood. In a more rural area, that's an entire town. Like I think there's maybe 10 census block groups in the entire city of Burlington, and there's two in Aalborg, Vermont. And what was nice about census block group was that our, our source was the American Community Survey, which is an annual survey that the census administers. And they ask a question on household income. So we had really fine data around household income which allowed us to come up with really nice estimates of burden. And they also ask a question around um, household expenditure on heating. So that was our source of data for income and um, heating expenditure. For electricity expenditure, we had data from Efficiency Vermont, and that was actual usage data, so that's by far our best data set. And then for transportation spending, we used the Location Affordability Index, which is an index that's developed, that was developed and maintained by HUD, the federal agency HUD, and it um, has estimates of transportation energy use and spending for every census block group in the United States. And they use a combination of survey data and modeling to come up with really robust estimates. So we did a hotspot analysis in ArcGIS to identify clusters of both high spending and highly burdened communities. And my hope was really to, one, kind of establish energy burden as a good metric to guide policy and programming, and two, to come up with a systematic way to prioritize communities that are maybe most in need. So I'll go through each energy category, we called them, starting with electricity. So this is electricity expenditure for every census block group in Vermont, and I do not necessarily have an explanation for every geographic pattern that emerged. The hope was just that it could guide programming to some extent. Um, so we have a huge cold spot in the Northeast Kingdom, cold spot in Chittenden County, and then hot spots in more rural and agricultural areas of the state. And then this is burden. So this is spending on electricity expressed as a percentage of median household income. And so once we correct for household income, that cold spot in the Northeast Kingdom disappears. So relative to the rest of the state, although they're spending less on electricity, they're, act they're right on par. It's this relatively the same amount that other towns are spending. And then Rutland emerges as a hot spot, and Chittenden County remains as, as a cold spot in terms of usage and burden. This is thermal energy. So we have another cold spot in Chittenden County, and kind of a hot spot in some of the rings around it in parts of Washington County. A thermal energy burden. The Northeast Kingdom emerges again as a hot spot and then Bennington and Rutland. So in Bennington and Rutland, it looks like they're not necessarily using more energy than in other areas of the state, but they're more highly burdened. And this is transportation. So this was the most interesting map to me just because that's the field that I work in. Um, and again, no big surprises, I think, but it's, it's really helpful for me just to see it mapped out. So as you'd expect, our most urban areas are cold spots. So we see Burlington, Montpelier, Rutland, even parts of Bennington, people are using relatively less energy, they're spending less, and then you can kind of see commuter sheds around Chittenden County and around Montpelier area. So pre that's presumably people are driving relatively high miles to reach their jobs in those areas. And then when we look at burden, 
Chittenden County stays as that big cold spot. It even kind of grows, most likely due to relatively high incomes there. And the Northeast Kingdom, once again, is a hot spot. This is total energy, so this is all three en energy categories combined. It looks really similar to the transportation energy map because transportation is such a large component of total energy and total energy burden. So we also ranked every community um, for bo by both burden and spending. So that, that hotspot analysis is helpful for identifying clusters. So um, if you were looking at, a, at targeting a, a general area of the state, whereas the rankings are, would guide a more targeted programming. It, that, that just identifies a particular, you know, just Springfield, a particular neighborhood in St. Johnsbury. And these are the five most highly burdened census block groups in the state, as we estimated, looking at total energy. So not surprising, they're all relatively, have low median household income, so around $20,000, and their estimated energy burden is about 20, 25% of that total income. We also identified high spenders, so high energy users, and there's a lot more variation in income here. So we have one relatively high income area, Charlotte, but the rest are really middle of the pack between 50 and, 7, 50 and 70 thousand dollars in median household income, and energy burdens around 10 percent. So what do we do with the results? My hope was, number one, to identify high priority communities. To I just put a stake on the map and say these areas are in need of some relief. Um, I also really wanted to make the conversation more about total energy efficiency than I, this was a project that I did for Efficiency Vermont, which has a really specific mandate related to reducing electricity usage. And I guess I thought that total energy burden might be perhaps a more um, powerful metric for guiding some of the low income work that we do. It wouldn't, it doesn't just need to be about electricity usage when we're identifying <coughs> communities that might be most in need of assistance. Um, and then finally, to inform policy. So I know there's been bubbling up here and there talk about a carbon tax here in Vermont, and there's been some interest in this report from that. And I, um, I guess my hope is that energy burden can kind of be a check to make sure that rural, low, and moderate income households aren't, don't bear the brunt of whatever carbon tax emerges. So I think like part two of this for me would be really thinking about how transportation energy burden can be eased in this state. I think it's, I know transportation is a really difficult nut to crack, um, but I think we've kind of passed the point of not having to talk about it anymore because it is such a large component of our greenhouse gas emissions as a state, and we know it's such a large proportion of our household budgets. So I think it's, we can really think creatively about how to reduce our reliance on petroleum and how to reduce the need for personal vehicles, because that's an enormous expense for many households. And right now, in many places, I would say most places in Vermont, if you can't afford to own and maintain a vehicle, you probably can't access your job, you may not be able to access the doctor, and just be a more active member of your community. Um, I found energy burden to be a really excellent metric. I think it'd be a, it can be a good measure of success of our existing efficiency programs as well as some of our policies. Um, and as I said before, I, can, I think it can be a means of protection for low and moderate income households. Um, something that came, I was kind of surprised by this analysis was the, um, I think that total energy was interesting in that um, if you have households that maybe look like they're doing okay, but once you account for how high, I think, like, I'm mainly thinking of moderate income households in more rural areas that have a really high transportation energy burden, um, they wouldn't, they're not necessarily going to be singled out for any sort of low income assistance. But um, I would argue they are perhaps just as close to the edge as lower income communities in, in urban areas. And I think it would be amazing if we could expand the scope of our existing programs to consider total energy rather than having them so siloed. And I understand, I know why they are so siloed. I don't mean that as a criticism. I just wonder if it's time to begin to think a little bit bigger. So I think that's it. 
Yeah. Oh, that's just a, those are just slides for fun. <laughs> if any questions come up. But yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Are we doing questions now? Or no, we'll wait. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Justine. I think that um, provides an important context to what we're talking about. And I'm going to take a little bit of time to also set a bit of a stage. Um, so my name is Krista Schude. I'm currently at the Vermont Law School um, as the Global Energy uh, Fellow for Climate Justice. and. Um, we, uh, at the clinic, we work on actual projects um, throughout New England. Um, and the clinician, or the fellow before me, worked on a uh, report that will be coming out um, at the end of this year um, around um, some of these issues. So, you know, why when we look, uh, so, so just as a presentation structure, looking at why does it matter, what are the barriers, what are some of the issues with some of the solutions? And, and again, that's really setting the stage. Some of this stuff we know, and some of it we need to, to just remind ourselves about why, why are we here and what are we doing. Um, so from a, from a why it matters standpoint, and to just give a, a statistic, what is low income? So low income is defined a lot of different ways, if it's on the national level or if it's defined from um, an area to area level. And the US government defines um, low income as 200% of poverty, which is equivalent to $48,000 for a family of four. 24, 25% of Vermont families are in poverty or low income. 44% of the United States children live in low income. I mean, that's just a staggering figure. So from both the perspective of the, what these um, families and individuals go through and, and have to deal with, and also the fact that this is a huge part of our community. So when we're looking at trying to get to 90 by 50, we need to think about our entire community, not just um, the, top, the top percentage. Um, there's a huge uh, burden uh, difference. So 7.2% um, is the energy burden on the low income, whereas um, moderate and uh, higher incomes are looking in the two to three percent. So it's just a, the, the amount. Creating a lower energy burden for people, creating price stability where they know what the price is going to be. We have a lot of volatility that I think is projected in our future, both in electricity prices and the, um, the amount that's going to have to be raised for grid infrastructure, et cetera but also in mitigating volatile fuel prices. So when we talk about community solar, maybe not today and maybe not in a couple of years, but when we talk about community solar, that can also be making a difference on the heating perspective and burden there. It can also be making a difference on the transportation perspective because you can you know, bring in um, cold climate heat pumps, you can bring in transportation. Now obviously those are in their nascent, um, uh, stages and they're not affordable to low income, but we need to be thinking down the road. And when you're looking at installing a solar panel that's going to last 25 to 40 years, then yes, the possibility of that panel also justifying or uh, assisting um, in transportation and in heat can become real. Um, the increase in equity via ownership, um, you know, when we look at enabling people to own something rather than constantly being given a handout, there's a psychological difference in that. And so if we can enable people to feel an ownership in what they've got, then I, I think that that's um, good for them from a societal perspective, um, but it also uh, creates an involvement um, in their community. So, um, and obviously from a community, these are, um, you know, the amount of money that we can invest um, now to lower the cost of the supporting institutions, whether that's affordable housing entities or the YMCA or other entities, if we can lower their costs by an investment now, then we 
um, have the ability for them to make a bigger impact down the road. So a lot of these are obvious and get talked about a lot, the suitability of homes, their renters, not owners, um, how do low-income people deal with upfront costs, they don't have good credit scores, or they don't have credit scores at all, they may not even show up on um, uh, a credit um, site, uh, and their ability to um, have an appetite for tax credits, and a lot of it is education. A lot of it is, a lot of these are wealthy assumptions, right? Oh, I can't afford solar. Well, actually, maybe you can. I can't take, credit, take tax credits. Actually, you can carry them forward, so maybe you can. Um, and a big barrier is time and priorities. I mean, these people are fighting to eat. They're fighting to get, uh, if they're lucky, <laughs> to get telecommunications and to get high-speed internet. They're fighting. Um, to, to make it day to day, and so they don't have a lot of time to dedicate to trying to figure out if there's a better way. So some of the solutions um, that have come up for community solar um, are, okay, well, what we really need to do is to, to lower the barriers to financing. So low-income people, it's, it's easier for them to, to, to get financing. The issues that need to be taken into consideration is you may have a green program that has enabled funding and financing for that individual, but if that loan for that solar unit means that they now have a debt to income ratio or debt to equity ratio, when their car breaks down and they go to the bank, because now they can't go to that green fund, they got to go to the bank to get the car and they can't get that car, we've not done those individuals a favor, right? So when we think about it, we need to take, we need to make sure it's not predatory, we need to take those future considerations into, into account. Um, from a leasing perspective, you know, it's no money down, um, here's, here's a solution um, to your problems. And those, some of those programs are really good, and, and some of them um, have a lot of, um, uh, small print involved in them, and the education on which is what um, is very difficult uh, for someone that doesn't have the time or doesn't really understand what the small print is even talking about. Um, I mentioned the investment tax credit. It can carry forward, and that's been, you know, that's something that's not really known or understood. You can keep moving your investment tax credit forward, but one of the concerns that's come up with the sunset is when the sunset happens, does that mean that your credit stops being able to be carried forward, and that's an unknown, so um, there's a concern there. And then from the education perspective, it's, you know, education is vital. Combining efficiency education and um, renewable education is really critical for the communities, but it's a matter of how do, they, how do they find the time to do it, to make it a priority, and how do they trust who's going to do it. So, um, setting the stage <laughs> from that, I mean, community solar can meet some of um, the needs uh, that, uh, that, that we need to look at. It can create efficiencies in lowering the costs. Um, it can allow renters to participate and use smaller projects that they might be able to afford. Um, and, you know, around the issues of consumer protection, um, the, the Clean Energy uh, States Alliance uh, has done a report on consumer protection for community solar, which I think is a, it's a good report that addresses some of the, the concerns around low-income issues. Um, so, from uh, uh, the goals of community solar, Financially decreasing costs, economies of scale, socially increasing access and creating equity and access to um, solar and those who need it. Um, and then from um, uh, one of the one of the one of the key pieces on the goals of community solar and that's also related to consumer protection is the issue around is it solar? And if we're gonna invest in solar um, is, do we have the, the recs that are making it um, a solar unit or have we, have we sold the recs? Um, so we need to 
make sure that people are educated so that they understand are they investing in community solar or are they investing in um, you know an, another energy source. Um, one of the things that I want to point out, and it'll come up in the um, projects that I'll talk about in just a minute, is the differences between virtual net metering in Vermont and New Hampshire. So one of the things that New Hampshire um, does, so in Vermont, virtual net metering provides a credit on um, the bill of the individuals. In New Hampshire, um, for better or worse, but actually turns out for better in some cases, um, the payment is made to the group host. It's uh, dollar-based, not credit-based, so you don't, you don't lose your credits when at the end of the year. Um, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later and why that can, can make a difference in low-income community projects. So we'll talk about three projects. One, um, uh, work that VLS has done in Vermont. Um, another work that the law school is working on in New Hampshire, and then some of the other projects that we're touching on and just, just getting into. So um, the Vermont uh, Law School has done a couple of community solar projects um, and that have been successful under the old net metering rules. And we're pretty severely challenged um, by the recent changes. Um, the clinic feels strongly that uh, solar energy uh, means that you're retaining those recs. And so the six cent penalty for rec compensation has really um, resulted in a pretty um, significant uh, change in the monetary aspects of those um, projects. So it's really gone from 19 cents a kilowatt hour to nine cents a kilowatt hour. The green field penalty um, makes it more difficult and more expensive and the permitting prices under the new, um, under the new uh, uh, methodology has, uh, has increased and made it more difficult. Um, so some of the successes that we've seen, um, we're gonna find more challenging if we uh, maintain the same structure that we have now. Um, on a national level, when we talk about community solar, you know, there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. And if we have a lot of entities that want to come into a community solar project, there are some things that we need to take into consideration, such as securities regulations. And um, there's something called the Howey test. Uh, it's got, it's a four-prong test. Um, it wants to know, is, it's from the, based on a U.S. Supreme Court case. Is there an investment of money? Is it in a common enterprise? Is it based solely on the efforts of a promoter or a third party? Um, and is there an expectation of profit? So there's two things when we talk about community solar to keep in mind. If we base this on the community, if it's our town energy committee, if it's the town itself, if it's the school, if it's neighbors that are coming together and working as a group, that's a lot different than a developer that's going out and saying, hey, you should do this because it's gonna, you know, you're gonna put in this much and you're gonna get this much back in the form of you know, credits or um, whatnot. And so you, you know, that's an important part of meeting that test. Um, and then the second piece is, is there an expectation of profit, which is the, the, the fourth part, but is there an expectation of profit? Well, if there's an expectation to be making an environmental contribution and there's an expectation to lower electricity bills, then that's not necessarily an expectation of profit. So, you know, these are very case-by-case -case, um, specific issues. Um, and part of the problem is that there is some guidance and there are some letters of no action that can give us guidance, but we have to, we still have to be very careful from a state securities regulations and from a um, federal securities regulation, how a project stands. That doesn't make it easier to invest in community solar projects. The other piece that's really difficult is that 41 states changed their net metering, 40 states plus DC, sorry, changed their net metering in Q1 of 2017 for a total of 134 actions taken. And in Q2, it was 39 states plus DC um, because Vermont didn't take action in Q2, just in Q1. So that's another 140 actions. And so when we're constantly changing the policies that we're um, uh, uh, involved with, 
it's difficult for um, communities and low-income communities uh, and low-income, you know, nonprofit providers that are trying to provide to these communities to keep caught up with it. Um, so just a couple of uh, potential policy solutions, um, you know, looking at uh, rebates instead of tax credits that are specific to low-income individuals. In Vermont, green fields are no longer a preferred site. Well, what if they were a preferred site if there was a certain uh, percentage of them that were going to low income? Um, the credit enhancements piece um, can facilitate financing into community projects. And the creation of solar garden trusts, which is a, you know, a concept that want to work off of like the community land trust uh, concept and make things in perpetuity. So just some potential ideas that we can uh, work from. And one of the things, when, when I speak of low income, I want to be really specific too. It's, it's not just low income individuals, but the, low, but the community that supports low income. So whether it's, again, affordable housing entities, um, the YMCAs, churches, I mean, entities that are actually supporting these communities could be part of this um, approach. So when we looked at, okay, what are additional ways um, that we can work in today's environment, um, we wanted things that were familiar enough for what developers were doing, used existing incentives, could be replicable, had the potential for um, USDA REAP funding, either grants or loan guarantees. And we recognize that it's always a combination. It's a three-legged stool of education, incentives, and financing. Um, so in Vermont, it's sort of the classic community solar project. You know, a participant pays to be a part of the project. Um, they get uh, electricity, um, goes into the grid, and they receive a credit on their bill. Um, the other project that many people are familiar with is sort of the basic PPA model. So we create an LLC to hold the project. We have um, a developer ownership um, of the LLC um, with off takers. We're able to take advantage of the tax credits. We're able to take advantage of accelerated depreciation. Um, and uh, if, they, if, the, if the RECs want solar, then, then they keep the RECs in, in hand. So when we tried to look at how do we modify this for low income, we looked at um, a model in New Hampshire is they have what's called residential um, own communities, and these are basically cooperatives, either in buildings or in land, um, uh, uh, like mobile home parks, where the cooperative is owned by all the individuals that own the mobile homes. And what you now have is an entity that you can negotiate with. It's a cooperative, so you've got to have, the community has to be on board. But it does provide um, an opportunity because that cooperative actually has an asset, right? It's got all of the land that it's sitting on. You don't have to worry about the actual score, um, the credit score of the individual uh, homeowner. You don't have to worry about whether or not the mobile home can structurally take the solar. Oftentimes, these communities have land that can be used for the project, so you can reduce your leasing costs or your land acquisition costs. Um, and so what we um, are doing uh, in New Hampshire is essentially um, a PPA buyout model. And um, it's working with a tax equity partner that can I mean, that's reducing the price of the project by 40%, right? Sometimes more. Um, that works with an installer. In New Hampshire, the rebate goes directly to um, the tax equity partner. And um, up here at the top, you'll see that the utility makes the net metering payment to the host. In this situation, the host is the residential owned cooperative or uh, residential and community, which can be either a cooperative or an LLC, depending on how they've set it up. So that means that the payment is going to go then go from the ROC to the tax equity partner. And this eliminates 
the concern or the risk on the tax equity investor about whether or not they're going to get paid by folks that are trying to make a, diff, uh, a choice between heating and eating, right? And so that's going straight through to here. In addition, the price um, and a, a, a nominal amount, so it's not a large amount, but an amount goes back to the members and an amount goes to the buyout fund. So the net metering payment goes in three directions. A little bit goes to the actual homeowners, a, a portion of it goes to a buyout fund, and a portion of it goes to the tax equity to pay for the electricity, because essentially this is a, you know, they're paying for the electricity under the PPA. Here down at the below in New Hampshire, um, there's a community loan fund, and it's, it's uh, one of its primary purposes is funding residential owned communities so that they can invest in themselves, so that the money isn't going out to somebody, but it's going to themselves, and then redistributed. And so in this situation, the community loan fund can pretty much guarantee what that price point of capital um, uh, loan investment is going to be in year six, seven, or eight when the buyback happens. So those um, agreements can happen at day one, which lowers the risk for the residential loan community. Um, so essentially taking a, a, a standard model, reducing um, costs from uh, property uh, contributions and um, enabling uh, a buyback so that they do actually become owners in years seven and onward. Um, the different um, rocks, um, how much goes, how much of that nominal payment goes to the members versus how much goes to the buyout fund and how much needs to be borrowed in year eight, that's sort of all part of the negotiation for every individual um, project. And it starts with um, education, right? It starts with going in and presenting to the community on efficiency and solar. So some of the other models that we're working on in Massachusetts, um, we have a model that's uh, similar, um, two pieces um, that are slightly different. One is um, the goal is to have a percentage of subscription go to low to moderate income at a lower price point. Um, so those with higher income um, not getting as, as high a return, but doing um, part of it sort of in a philanthropic um, thought. Uh, the other piece um, in Massachusetts is having a, a nonprofit off taker that has flexibility in how much they're taking. So if the subscription lowers because, you know, there's all of a sudden a plant closes down and a bunch of people move out of town, there's somebody that can take up those low income homes, uh, the, the energy that they would have been taking out of the project. There's a, a project in New Hampshire called Solar Shares. They're working on philanthropic use, a philanthropic development of solar. So it uses donations, volunteers. Um, and one of the things that we're working with them is how do you, how do you mix this standard project with philanthropic and make that work? And so that's part of our work. Um, and then um, working on modeling the community land trust uh, concept. So the energy clinic, um, we do solar outreach and education, step-by-step -step guidance on um, community solar development, um, model contracts, and policy research and development work. Again, just out of curiosity, before I get started, how many people had an opportunity to hear the remarks during the lunch session? So I know if I'm being repetitive, that looks like most everyone. Okay, so that being the case, since we are very time constrained here, I am going to jump right into the weeds. So as you all know, uh, we are a nonprofit general and electrical contractor. We have an applied advocacy model 
We are actually delivering solar, both shared solar and rooftop solar, directly to low-income communities and households that are dependent specifically on federal energy assistance. Over the course of the past several decades now, we've been integrating solar into this national energy assistance program. And one of the reasons that Olivia invited us to come out here is because our program is national in scope in that the federal energy assistance program in this model is also a national program. And so one of the things that's unique about our approach is that it is in no way, shape, or form dependent on the third party tax equity model. The tax equity model is a fantastic model that has driven a lot of solar development and some low income solar development. However, the tax credit is ephemeral. Shortly, it will be behind us. And so we've really advocated for models that aren't dependent on a third party tax equity model. And furthermore, with the third party tax equity model, one of the things to be very aware of is that it really can dilute the volume of benefits going to the intended beneficiary. So we're advocating for a model that's going to ensure that the vast majority of the benefits are actually flowing to our low income neighbors. And so one of the reasons we have a singular emphasis on integrating solar into energy assistance is the opportunity to scale rapidly. Again, as you heard me say earlier, this program is national in scope. And so if we're able to effectively create a solar carve out within the low income energy assistance program, there's the opportunity to scale low income solar nationally over the course of a few short years. So we have been uh, creating uh, community solar for community action in the upper Midwest. And one of the things I want to make sure that I mention, since we're very scarce on time, is that we have a commitment as part of a DOE grant to pilot this model here in the state of Vermont as well. So one of the things I wanted to make sure I create time for is a call to action. We are actually seeking partners to develop an energy assistance integrated community solar project here in Vermont. So one of the reasons that we were eager to come here and be a part of this conversation today is to build those relationships and to queue up a project over the course of the next year. So I also wanted to uh, share some of the details with regard to how this project works. And although this is a little bit cumbersome, I think what I would rather do is spend a little bit of time on this. So as I mentioned earlier, we're making a massive investment already on behalf of our low income neighbors through the energy assistance program, upwards of $5 billion per year. The families that benefit from energy assistance pay nothing. For receiving that service, there's no question about their credit. There's no question about how long they'll be in that household. There's no scrutiny in that regard. It's simply based on income eligibility. And so we're generating a model where credit score is a non-issue. It's moot. We're creating a model where it's based simply on income eligibility, and the families aren't expected to pay anything for participating in the community solar assets that we're developing. Why? Primarily because this integrates with energy assistance. If we want to leverage this national infrastructure, it needs to be a hand in glove with the existing intake process. So for those of you that are familiar with community solar, you're well aware of the fact that typically subscriptions or shares have a relatively long term, 20, 25 years. It depends on the project. It's project specific. What we're suggesting is that the community action agencies, which are on the front line of energy assistance and delivering this service, they have an annual intake process. When I was eligible for energy assistance, I applied one September. If I was still income eligible the following year, I would apply again and receive the service. Therefore, in our contracts, when we deliver low income community solar in partnership with community action agencies, we've simply built in an annual transferability clause so that the energy assistance recipient can receive the benefits of that subscription for one calendar year. So for example, in partnership with the Southeast Vermont Community Action Agency, we're hoping to deploy a 150 kilowatt low income, 100% low income community solar project, no tax equity finance whatsoever. We will be using LIHEAP dollars for this investment. And that's really the critical point is we're making this investment already. Do we want it to have a 20? Do we want the benefits to flow for 20 years? Or does that investment only last for one year? So with that 150 kilowatt community solar asset, the size of the subscriptions would be sized according to a household's need. There's already a relatively complex calculus for how much energy assistance dollars 
a family receives. When I was on energy assistance, we received about $1,400 per year. So therefore, the size of our subscription would be roughly equal to what that benefit calculus has determined. And then the community action agency, in this case, SEVCA, would distribute these subscriptions on an annual basis based on need. If a household is eligible one year and eligible again the next year, they would continue to receive the value of that subscription through virtual net metering credits. LIHEAP dollars will be used for this installation. And that's the funding source for this. So again, there's no expectation that the family uh, actually pay for this service because it's a social service that's already being provided. Now, one criticism that people share as we promote our model is that energy assistance is a crisis bill assistance. To take dollars away from a crisis bill assistance to provide to invest in the capital intensive technology is really robbing Peter to pay Paul. I couldn't agree more. We do not want to jeopardize, siphon, use the bill assistance dollars from energy assistance. They're a safety net that our neighbors depend on. So rather than use the core bill assistance dollars provided by LIHEAP, we're suggesting that we access some of these subsets of energy assistance which are also available nationwide. So every single state and territory in the union can spend up to 15% of its total LIHEAP appropriation on what's typically known, and again, I warned you we were going to get into the weeds here, typically referred to as the EAP wax transfer mechanism. It's where energy assistance dollars are essentially taken from the bill assistance and given to the weatherization program. They don't have to be given to weatherization. The authorizing legislation of this subset is to reduce long-term dependency on energy assistance. And again, I can tell you from personal experience, long-term dependency on energy assistance is the rule, not the exception. And so by using a portion of EPWAX transfer to slowly integrate community solar into the community action agency network, we're actually meeting the spirit of the authorizing legislation. And furthermore, and most importantly, we're not actually using the core bill assistance dollars. The other two subsets, or the other subset I want to point out is Assurance 16. Assurance 16 is a fund that's typically used, again, for community action agencies, the SEVCAs of the world, if you will, to do outreach and education to the folks that are potentially eligible for energy assistance. Many families that are income eligible don't even know the service exists. A great example are New Americans. So a lot of Assurance 16 dollars are used to do outreach to low-income communities to ensure they're aware of this viable an important service. This fund can be used for two things. Customer acquisition, to use the sol solar development nomenclature, and also the administrative costs that would potentially be shouldered by the community action agency to manage this new tool in their toolkit. So these two dollars, these two subsets of LIHEAP dollars are not core bill assistance. We've never advocated for using the core LIHEAP dollars for this program, but rather these two subsets. And I would also like to point out that Vermont is well ahead of the curve on this national model in that they're starting to identify and quantify any reduction in heating degree days and create a set aside or restricted fund specifically for delivering low income community solar in partnership with community action agencies. The state's LIHEAP appropriation is based partially on heating degree days or cooling degree days, depending on, in the parlance of energy assistance, whether you're a heating state or a cooling state. So each and every year that Vermont experiences fewer heating degree days, a restricted fund will be created for the future deployment of low-income community solar, formally integrated into the energy assistance program. And finally, I also want to mention a new and emerging finance instrument called Pay for Performance or Pay for Success, otherwise known as social impact bonding. It's specifically for entities outside of the public sector that are, it bring an innovation or a disruption to the public sector. This instrument allows organizations, quite frankly like ours, to say to a public sector actor that we believe we have a more fiscally responsible way to deliver the exact same service. And just to give you 
Just to provide some credibility for this emerging finance instrument, this is not a hippy-dippy finance instrument. The biggest issuer of social impact bonds, Goldman Sachs, the Rockefeller Foundation, et cetera. This is a very exciting way where social services are tied to performance. You actually have to deliver a better return on investment. So I'm being very brief and I'm rushing through a few points here because unfortunately we're scarce on time and I wanna make sure that y'all have opportunity to ask questions. Uh, to the panelists, and so I just want to reiterate the fact that if we want to scale low-income solar, we can do so in partnership with the National Energy Assistance Program. We're already making this investment on behalf of our low-income families, and we can do so without burdening our low-income neighbors with any additional costs and jeopardizing their financial resiliency. Thank you. I want to thank all our panelists. You make the moderator's job very easy um, when you have such great presentations. Uh, the questions really write themselves here. Uh, there's was so much knowledge on this panel that we probably could have gone on for three hours, but we have a few minutes, we, at least three hours maybe. Um, we have time for a few questions. So I want to throw it open to the audience for any questions of our panel. Well, if you don't have any, I have a couple. Uh, I w oh, I'm sorry, over here, right in front. Emily. Justine, in your presentation, you mentioned that um, you had some ideas based on your research on how to have um, potential pollution pricing or carbon pricing uh, that didn't adversely affect um, parts of the state that are paying a lot more for uh, transportation. I'm curious what those are. Well, I, it would depend on the, the policy proposed. I guess I saw more. I saw. Um, Did you the oh, yep. sorry. The question was. Um, what specific, can, can you repeat it? What specific what, uh, I, I, what's, in looking at the carbon tax, how might we implement a carbon tax in a way that doesn't impact the communities that are uh, disproportionately affected on energy burden? Yes, thank you. Um, I guess I, I saw energy burden as kind of a check on a carbon tax more than um, the policy in and of itself. Um, but I, yeah, because the, and it's, um, I think it commonly cited it around you know any any sort of fee based on vehicle miles traveled or um, is always going to disproportionately affect rural communities. Um, but yeah, so I, I mean I think there are any number of oh, like kind of convoluted um, mean credits or but means of uh, just mitigating that impact on lower income households either in sometimes it's in terms of a it can be a reimbursement sometimes it can be a credit but they're yeah so i i don't i don't i guess it would depend on the, the specific proposal but the um when people talk to me about the carbon tax i saw energy burden as a means of um just ensuring that that burden wasn't exacerbated i guess without some alternative available to people uh, um, this is a federal program you're talking about. Is is there any uh, does state policy, state regulation affect this program at all? And are there ways that the state can help or hinder this process? Did everyone get a question? So you're correct. Uh, this is a federal program, and state energy assistance managers wield an enormous amount <laughs> of decision making authority. And we've met with the federal program managers, the director of energy assistance, and she has said unequivocally, there are no regulatory or statutory barriers to this model. It simply takes innovation and political will at the state level. That's it. That's directly from the director of energy assistance. Yes. Just to follow up on the, um, on the model, I'm not understanding why you wouldn't choose to also use the tax equity investor. I mean, that's 40% of, you could, if you, if you blended this with the kind of traditional tax equity model, wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't we be spending less of those dollars and more of the investors' dollars? Potentially for, did everyone hear the question? Just potentially for a few years, but we're really trying to create the model that's going to 
transcend the sunset of the tax equity. So rather than investing time and energy in creating a tax equity based model, we're trying to create one that's going to work in 2025 and 2030 using these mechanisms. However, you're right, we certainly could and we have done some projects like that, but what we found is it really dilutes the value that's actually going to the individual energy assistance eligible household. In fact, we've done a project in Minnesota where on a monthly basis the household receives $2.16 value, and that was one using the tax equity model. We'd rather see the 100% of the value go to the low-income families. We have only time for one more question, unfortunately. Ma'am, right in front here. So would you, Jason, would you then um, take, uh, I'm sorry, I can't see him, but would you then have just work each year on a, a group of people and do their homes or you try to do as much as you can in one year? How does that work? How would you parcel it out? I, that's a great question. So do a lot in one year or a small amount annually? I think uh, the latter is probably the most politically prudent approach. And so for example, in the case of Vermont, if we're setting aside a restricted fund based on heating degree days, reductions or a reduction in heating degree days, we could potentially do a half a megawatt annually and then serve all of the low income households in the state of Vermont that are dependent on electric heat or we could do one for each community action agency of which there are eight in the state. So I think doing it, doing one annually is the most politically prudent approach and speaking of political prudence, one other thing that I would say with regard to that is that this is potentially a bipartisan effort. There are a lot of folks that are right of center that see value in this model in that it's reducing the long-term size of a social service and making it a more fiscally responsible investment. So in Minnesota, we're trying to do one for every single community action agency every single year. With that, let's give Justine, Krista, and Jason a great round of applause. What a great panel.